for the Chapter 21 lecture, we're talking about expanding stimulus control. So a quick review of what we mean by stimulus control involves reviewing discrimination to establish stimulus control. So what we have here is, this will be a little review, we have the ABCs and we hypothesize the function. So with our antecedents, our ABCs, we have stimuli and in order for a stimulus to become a discriminative stimulus we have to reinforce that response with some kind of reinforcement positive or negative reinforcement so we can maintain or increase behavior keep the behavior going and if we respond to other stimuli that becomes an s delta because when the here when they respond they respond to this stimuli the wrong one we don't do anything with consequences so in order to get stimulus control, before we can expand, we have to get stimulus control, we have to do discrimination training. So discrimination training might be if I want to teach a child to identify the color red, I'll present red, I'll say touch red, the child touches red, I say yes, good, correct, that's red, here's a sticker. I'm going to reinforce correct responses to red. When I put other colors there and the child touches some other color, I say no, try again, I don't reinforce it. So when I build this response, behavior consequence connection to this consequence is contiguous, close to, happens very close together, then this reinforcing consequence takes on the property of strengthening this behavior under these conditions. So this environment evokes the behavior because antecedent stimuli evoke behavior. They don't cause it, they don't elicit, that's a respondent term. It evokes behavior. The color red now has been reinforced, touching the color red, it's been reinforced and it's now in the repertoire, and touching red, touching any other color does not get reinforced. So now the person learns to discriminate stimuli, and now when they are more likely to respond correctly to red, when I ask for red, I can say I've established stimulus control. So if I say touch red is the instruction, sometimes called instructional control, that we teach people to do the instructions. Teachers are always developing instructional control, Parents in the home like to think they're in developing instructional control, but kids don't always do what we tell them. But in our field, we're looking at how do we get instructional control? We do it by discrimination training. So we teach discrimination and reinforce correct responses. We don't reinforce incorrect responses. And then now we say this stimulus controls this response. I want to make the distinction. It's not a cause-effect relationship. It doesn't cause them to do it because it's still a learned voluntary operant. But you, can, you have a history. This signals the likelihood of reinforcement if I'm asked to respond under these conditions. Because of the past history, I'm more likely to respond. So I respond correctly. And when I'm now getting, I, the, the likelihood of responding correctly is stronger. I now have stimulus control. So I've taught discrimination. Discrimination means I, I don't respond to other things. Now, that's the first piece to get stimulus control. And now, in this chapter, we're talking about expanding stimulus control. Now, the, in order to expand it, we want to get generalization, and we want to get other stimuli to be paired and become SDs. So, I want to have a number of, other, if I use an example of something red, a red color, there are shades of red. And if I'm using a red square piece of paper, I want to make sure the child can generalize and not, they're not always going to see red in a square. They're going to see red clothing, red articles, red pillows, red fans. So I want to pair it so that when I say, now show me something else that's red. Now find some, here, here are some pencils, here are some markers. Which of these markers is red? And so I'm going to program and teach generalization to expand control. If I say, go get me a red pen or red marker, go get me a red shirt. The child will now generalize, and they'll discriminate red from other colors, but they will generalize, and other stimuli that have the property of redness will be correctly selected. So I want something red, and I see it's the red one, they're going to grab the red one, not the other one. So now the stimulus control is when I'm asking for something with redness, there will be other items that are also SDs, and that will create generalization of responding. Now we've got the stimulus generalization. And stimulus generalization is going to be when I have now taught some stimuli, and I can't teach every single thing that's red and present it. But as I teach enough of the redness, 
this stimulus class, things that have redness, I can take something brand new they haven't responded to before and say, what color is that? And they might see a, a, a stuffed teddy bear, they might see a toy doll, uh, maybe see a little, a little Muppet, and that Muppet is red. And I've not taught them to respond to the red Muppet, but because I have taught them to generalize, they see other stimuli that have redness, and they can identify that little Muppet doll is red, that pillow is red, that chair is red. So when you get stimulus generalization, and we teach basic terms, that stimulus generalization then refers to those items in the stimulus class, and I'll, I'll basically all evoke the same basic response if I'm asking for red. If I'm talking to a child about getting dressed, and say getting dressed is the behavior, and I say, okay, to get dressed, you're gonna put on your clothes. So clothes become the stimulus class that evoke the behavior of getting dressed. So if I say, there, parents lay the clothes out, and they just put on your socks and shoes and underwear and pants and belt and shirt. So that stimulus class, a child might have a shirt that's a button shirt, might have a shirt that's zip, might have a shirt that's a pullover. And they all are still part of the same stimulus class of shirts. And so when they can respond to a new shirt, I haven't taught them to put on every single shirt or every type of shirt, but I've taught them enough to know that this is a shirt, it's not pants. They're discriminated shirts for pants. So when I'm teaching similar generalization, I teach the stimuli discrimination, so to make sure they get a shirt, and then I can teach I can bring in new shirts, buy a new shirt, and the child wasn't taught to that shirt, but they will generalize. So stimulus generalization then involves a new untrained stimulus. And this can be a really nice advantage because we just can't teach children everything and every match, every possible stimulus to every possible response. But once that response class has enough common properties, it will generalize and we can get into new environments, new items, and they will recognize enough of the properties of that stimulus class. They'll respond correctly to new items, new clothes. Now, sometimes we get overgeneralization, which is responding to stimulus class and overgeneralizing what that is. So an example might be teaching a child to a baby, a new baby starting to babble and make noises and say mom and dad and name things. And the child learns to recognize dad and discriminate dad from mom and says daddy when they see dad. Now, if they see a neighbor or somebody at the store and that man has a beard and dad has a beard, the child might overgeneralize and based on the properties of the beard say daddy to a man who is not the daddy. So that's overgeneralization. It's not, they're not discriminating between daddy and that man who looks like daddy. And that's so that's that's overgeneralization. So that has some advantages that the child will recognize uh, the, the different clothes that are shirts, but it may overgeneralize and call all men daddy. So that means we've got to go back to do some tighter discrimination between this one's daddy, that one's not daddy. I remember the very first time that a child called me daddy. It wasn't quite anything I expected. It was about 1965. I was at the drive-in theater. And out in front of the drive-in was a little patio with some chairs and some speakers. And I was talking to some, this is, this is in high school. And I'm talking to some cute high school girls. I'm trying to flirt with them. And all of a sudden, these two little children came running up to me. And they go, Daddy, Daddy, Mommy wants you in the car. Get some popcorn. And I look around. Like, I look at those children. And I realize I recognize those children. That's my ex-girlfriend's niece and nephew. And she's standing behind them laughing. So here I'm flirting with a couple of high school girls. I broke up with my old girlfriend. And she sends her cousins, her nephews, niece and nephew, to run up and call me daddy in front of these girls. And of course, the girls look at me and they just walk away like, oh, you've got children. I'm 16 years old. I don't, those aren't my children. So, yeah, yeah. So there was a, it was a purposeful, it wasn't really a general. So she told me to do it. But it's the first time I heard daddy. So many times I hear daddy now, I don't turn around unless I know it's my daughter's voice. They weren't overgeneralizing, but I was probably overreacting because it was a lesson I'll never forget. Okay, so that's generalization, overgeneralization. Now, just like we have generalization of stimuli, and I knew, so again, stimulus generalization is when we have the new untrained stimulus, but we get the same basic response. I still know how to put, I still put a shirt on. 
response generalization is when the response, and this is where we have different topographies of the way we move and the way we do something. And if response generalization, I've already been taught to respond to certain stimuli. And what I happens is that I run into a familiar stimuli that I do know. I know the stimulus class that evokes the behavior, but I do the behavior differently. So where I had a new stimulus for stimulus generalization, with response generalization, I emit, it evokes a new untrained response. And when I do that response, so this is response one, maybe I do response two, and it still is in response to this stimulus, and it still serves the same function. So, we, so when you have a new, when, it, when a child learns to do something differently than the way we taught them, but it still works, it's the same thing. Like if I've taught the, shirt, the child to pull on a t-shirt, and then one day I give him a shirt to button, it's still a shirt, so he knows he's supposed to, it evokes clothes dressing behavior, but he's gonna have to button it versus pull it over. Or if I get a jacket that has snaps, I didn't get a jacket with a zipper. And so he's responding, now he's learned to zip the jacket up. I didn't teach him to zip, but he figured out how to close that jacket. So if you see stories and examples of a new stimulus with an already known response, that was a new untrained stimulus, the person responds correctly, and that response produces the same reinforcing consequence. That still functions as a response that produces reinforcement. It meets the same function. I'm getting dressed, now I'm dressed, I go outside and play. If you see a story about a new behavior, someone did something differently, but it still results in the same basic consequence. So if I taught someone how to open a door, and the doors, they know about doorknobs, and then they have some of these doors that have a long bar, and you can push the bar and open the door, and someone comes up to that, but they've got their hands full, so they can't put their hands on the bar to push it open, but they turn off their backside, and they use their bottom, and they push on that bar, and the door opens. So it still meets the same function of door opening behavior, but it was with an untrained being. I didn't teach them to open the door by putting the butt on the bar and pushing, but they figured out I can open the door that way, or I could put my elbow on it. Typically, put your hands off. So as you learn, go through the chapter and run into practice questions, you're going to be you'll be discriminating between stories with a new stimulus you haven't seen yet. And one thing might be on your keyboards, you'll see. A stimulus, now a, a capital S and a small s look a lot alike, it's just the size. A capital R and a small r are still the same stimulus and the same stimulus class, and I can still read that. Now, if you put it in a different font, you'll now get maybe a slight angle to the font, or you might get little curlicues on the font, like a Times New Roman or something. Well, the stimuli is letters. And because we recognize letters, whether it's capital or lowercase, we still generalize. That's a new stimulus, but I know how to read that word with those letters in it. So there's a new untrained stimulus, but it's the same basic response. And then the other side of that, you will see behaviors, and you'll see the story talk about uh, that somebody responded to a known situation. They know the stimulus class, and they respond a little different, a variation of it. Sometimes you're teaching a child how to do something, and then you kind of put them to the test, or they end up in a situation, and they do it. They do it correctly, and it works. But you realize, that's not the way I taught you, but it worked. So there was response generalization. Just like stimulus generalization can overgeneralize, it can, it, can it can work and also it can backfire. The baby that calls all men daddy is embarrassing for somebody. And so like any type of generalization, the child that we've taught to respond to go to the bathroom in a toilet, in the bathroom at home, we go to a, a business, to a restaurant, and there's a sign that says boys and girls, and he knows how to see the boys sign. When he sees one says men and women, if he can generalize and realize the one for men, he sees the little graphic icon still symbols, symbolizes that's a men, boys bathroom. It says caballeros, or it says uh, some other name, some other label, if he can generalize to their stimulus, he'll still know to go to that bathroom for his bathroom. Now, if he's gone on a grocery, he's gone into some uh, Home Depot, and he's walking around with the parents, and there in the household department, particularly in the plumbing department, they're on display are toilets. So we've got a child that's been taught to go to the toilet in the home, and he sees the toilet in the Home Depot, and he walks up and drops his pants and starts to pee in the toilet. Well, now we've got response generalization gone awry. So there's we got to teach back discrimination.
But that's the basic thing to watch for. Stimulus generalization, new stimuli, same behavior, or oh, same, same stimuli and a new way to respond to it. Okay. The, uh, the next concept here is called correspondence training. And this is basically related to telling the truth. Do you do what you say you're going to do? So this correspondence training refers to saying and doing. Do you do the things you say you're going to do? And typically, a lot of us say, I'm going to do that later. I'm going to study tonight, or I'm going to do those dishes now, and we don't always do it. So the research shows that that sometimes gets as low as 30%. We don't always get around to doing what we said we're going to do. And when we're trying to teach people to learn things, we want to get them to do what they say. So they say they're going to do it. And then if, when they do it, we want to be sure we reinforce it. So if you're not getting cooperation, we have to make sure that we have them. We say what they're going to do, we give them instruction. They say they're going to do it, and then when they do it, we reinforce it. So when you run an example, some correspondence training, it's going to be basically do what you said you're going to do. It was what you say correspond with what you do. And that's in this chapter about getting more stimulus control. So when you talk about doing something, you actually do the behavior. Talking about it is one behavior. Doing it is the other. The other one, the last main concept here, is called exemplars. Use when you're trying to program for generalization, and this chapter will list some categories of how you can get more generalization. Um, they say use multiple exemplars. On a typical daily basis, we don't use the word exemplars very often. I would guess most of you probably don't use the word exemplar at all, and you don't need to. There's another simpler word that we do use. It's the same thing, yes, multiple examples. Exemplar must be a more technical term for that. So when we're trying to teach a child to generalize, we want to use a lot of examples. And we may request it, but like I said, if you're trying to teach him some, some, some thing, teach him about redness, what redness is, the concept of redness, which is a shade of light. I teach him about something that's red, and I have him identify it, and I say, now go find something in the next room that's red and tell me. So we go to another room where I didn't train him to respond to those red items but I have him identify red items. Then we go to the grocery store and we find which of these fruits are red. So I can use a lot of examples. In order to promote generalization, I use multiple examples of what that is. And I can request them to generalize, show me something new. That way I'm trying to teach them to recognize the concept. Stimulus control is a lot about this concept, this stimulus, this situation will evoke the right behaviors to that kind of stimulus that Bathroom doors will evoke the behavior of going to the right bathroom. Opening doors will evoke the behavior of pushing the bar, turning the knob, or pulling the handle. And we want to teach, teach instructional control, expand stimulus control, so we will recognize the stimulus class properties, be able to respond either the same way to something new, or respond similar, effectively respond in a manner that works, to something that's already familiar, but I've got another way to do it. It still manages to meet the needs and it results in the same function. Now I can, if I learn how to cook food, I cooked it differently this time, but it's still edible. So now I'm gonna get the function of having food cooked and now I can eat it. This all comes back to basically, as we, as we learn and as we train children to work with children, or work with clients, work with students, we're teaching them to respond to different letters and sounds and words and teaching them to respond and follow directions. We reinforce cooperation. We try to promote cooperation in the different teaching classrooms, promote cooperation at PE, promote cooperation at recess. So we give examples of how to behave, how to treat you, how to be a good sports and, uh, and just broaden their repertoire of cooperation and learning to discriminate and generalize under different situations. That just widens their world of, of abilities to respond to the environment. That's the main terms and concepts for chapter 21. Let me pause there. Uh, comments or questions? I know once you read it, it'll help a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of produce that as a open with that to give you an overview. All right. I see Fatima dropped in on us. So Fatima, I'm going to put you here. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Teresa, Alexis. Okay, good. I got everybody. I got you all counted. That's what I have for today. If you have any comments or questions, you can take them now or as you run through the chapter and you run into something and you say, oh, I forgot, email me.
and I can um, I can then email you back, or if you want to discuss something, we'll just set up a quick Zoom and we can cover. And that's basically how I did the course for 01, and that's what I will continue for 03. I'll have the weekly weekly office hour. I'll cover some basic concepts or whatever questions you raise. And then if I remember, I will try to record and post that video in case you want to go watch it or someone who couldn't make it. If you can't make it one week, I can, if I can remember record it, I'll post it on that same YouTube channel. And you can watch that and see if it helps make sense. Sometimes you'll get some examples from these little miniature office hours. And that's all I've got. Anybody have anything else they want to add? Everybody ready to celebrate the fourth? Does everybody actually have a day off? I know you've all got homework. So I will let you get to the homework. Okay, so this study guide, yes, the study guide, you know, it's the same, it's a same study guides. I, I sent an email that had all the study guides for for the third course. The thing I want to point out that you're going to do chapters 21 through 31. The first course was chapters 1 to 10. Second was 11 to 20. In this case, there's an extra chapter. So the last week you'll have chapters 30 and 31. You paid a lot of money for that book. I wanted to make sure you got every dollar's worth. And for the first time in years, you will realize I actually was assigned every single chapter in that book. And, um, and so the last two chapters will be combined. So that study, yeah, you're right. The page numbers are off. When, when, they, when they updated the study guide, when they updated the text, they did not go back into those, um, into the study guide. They left the same exact study guides on the web. But if you'll notice, you'll find a pattern and you'll notice it more now in chapter 21 that what they did, what they did in the book overall was they fleshed out some more chapters. So you'll find a pattern that once you find the answer, if it's study guide said, if the study guide said it was page 420, you may realize, oh, there it is on 422 or 423. So there'll be roughly three pages um, for three pages from what it said it was. And when you get on the chapters 25, 26, 27, they may notice there's a four page gap because they did expand some of the chapters, they added more information. But it's still, that if you, as you go through the chapter of the study, it still is a matching, it still matches, still flows in the same basic order. So the page numbers are not accurate, but they are still in the same sequence. And they're just, you know, getting you to spot them, you'll start to realize this chapter, everything is three pages later. By the time you get to chapter 27, it might be four or five pages beyond what the study guide said it was. It threw me off because I was developing the second edition test list for everything. And then the professor told me that there was a new book. The third edition had come out and the university wanted us to always use the latest version of the text. I already been developing my chapters. So I got the third edition text and I had to go back. Question, okay. Um, I'm not requiring that you comment on other people's posts. I see a question for a lot of online courses you're supposed to read something and then respond to three different people's comments. And um, because the study guides are so extensive, I don't require that in this course. We were not requiring that in this program. I know if you've had some other things before, a lot of courses they do say, you know, you've got to read it and you've got to respond to at least two other people, but you don't get credit for it. And um, we decided there's already so much writing in the study guides and there's so much exercise, mastery exercises, particularly the first three courses. The master exercises will drop down. You won't have so many in the, other, in the other courses. Nobody uses them as extensively as I do for the first three courses. But we decided just you write your posts. You don't have to go back. Otherwise, you're waiting for somebody to post when you early in the course. If you're getting ahead of the chapter and you posted your discussion, if nobody else has or three other people haven't, you can't finish up that part. So we don't require that you make comments. You're welcome to say something. If you see one you like, you're welcome to reply to that person and give them feedback. But um, it's not required for the to meet the discussion requirement. Just be sure you expand your answer to cover at least a hundred words. We do have to account for at least a thousand words in the course for a writing requirement. So by having ten, basically ten weeks with a hundred word answers for each concept, that hits a thousand words. The other option was to say at the end of the course write a thousand word paper, and I thought it'd be better to to just talk about, take, take the examples in that discussion question and read the definitions and then come up with examples or give how you would treat a case. So I read on a thousand page paper, not a thousand, a thousand word, thousand page paper, I don't know, bigger the book. It's better than a thousand word 
essay at the end of the chapter tied together, uh, that discussion it needs to be at least 100 words. If it's 100 words, I can give you a full credit. If it's less than that, if you give me 80 words, it's going to be four out of five points, something like that. Well, I, mean, I'm, I know this is the kind of work and the fact that I made all these master exercises, most people are not used to courses that do that because I'm a PSI guy and because that made me learn better. And since this board exam is hard, I didn't want you just to learn a definition. I wanted you to leave the course and leave the first three courses with realizing I need to know the concept. When you learn three different definitions, you're not just learning one phrasing, you're realizing that's the definition of a stimulus. That's the difference of a stimulus class. I can recognize things are going to say, if I'm setting the table, all the knife, fork, spoon, plug, bowl, those all make up the stimulus class. They're all both the behavior of table setting. And all the behaviors I do make up the response class. So I was trying to build, work on concept formation was my main goal for the first three courses. I having you read multiple definitions and learn to recognize the concept rather than just a pat phrase. And that I knew was gonna be a lot of extra work. So that's why I did not push for these other things that are more common. Even though it's more work, I was thinking of you. Okay. I thank you for the comments in the chat bar. I'm trying to remember to see this. I see them pop up. So I think I've answered everything that I ask. And I think I've answered what you ask. All right, I think we're done. You know how to reach me. I'm available. I will get back to you as quick as I can. And if you get, again, stuck on study guide questions or you just want to clarify concept, fire an email. Sometimes I can spell it out better. Sometimes we'll just jump on and do a two or three, five minute, whatever it takes to say, okay, I got it. I want to help you as much as I can through the course. By now, you pretty much know the drill. You've seen the pattern for one and two and three. Or three is like one. Um, then we hit four, five, and six. They will be different. They are going to be more advanced because they're higher level courses. And they're going to count on you already being familiar and savvy with the basic terms and concepts. When you go to four on functional assessment and how to find the function, you'll be recognizing these terms and concepts. And you get the five, it's going to be um, ABA and autism. So those examples that professor has done, been working in the field for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. So she will give lots of examples of how to use this for kids that have they're on the spectrum, although it's just behavior. The spectrum is not magic to it, it's simple, but still behavior. And then the last course, six, is gonna be all ethics. And uh, again, the, the, the structure for the last three don't use near the, they do some, like some of the exercises, but not near the level that I do them, because you're already gonna have most of the terms down by now, by the end of this, this course. And that was the main idea behind the design. 